reality. If you grew up with shows like Arthur, Sesame Street, or Thomas the Tank Engine, you probably know they have plenty of room for creative, spine-chilling tales. But instead today, let's look at the bottom rung of true literary train wrecks. Because when it comes to bad creepy pastors, we can truly never decipher where they're gonna go next. So let's check out 10 truly abysmal PBS Kids creepy pastors. And of course, if I'm talking creepy pastors, there's no way I'm not inviting one of my favorite YouTubers and an old friend of mine. Who do Hoodlum's Revenge? Glad to be back, Strider. Creepypastas are like second nature to me, so as always, I'm happy to help. And in case any of the authors of these stories come across this video, please do not take it to heart. We are only criticizing these stories and not you as people. Absolutely right, Dennis. These authors' stories have helped entertain a lot of people now, and for that, you have our thanks. Also, all links to the original Creepypastas are in the description below. And with that, let's begin. Hey Boo, you ever heard of Ghost Hole Mine? Oh, oh cool. Is it haunted? Ah, oh, yeah. lot makes logical sense for sure, no. Anyway, let's check it out anyway. Thomas, all aboard the dead team. I will never look at Thomas and friends the same again after what I have seen. I was in a goodwill, and I found this Steamies vs. Diesel's VHS tape. That's a lucky find. Very convenient for the story as well. There was no spine or back to the cardboard case, so I just thought, whatever. <laughs> Fair enough, whatever man, whatever floats your boat. Once I came home, I shoved my tape into the VCR and it started. The Thomas intro was in reverse, and the sky was red throughout the whole video. I didn't take much notice, and I just kept watching. The episode Thomas to the Rescue had no narration, and it skipped to the part where Diesel was boasting about his new fuel. Thomas had an evil grin on his face. Instead of Diesel just breaking down, he exploded! So did Mavis. I saw blood! Ding! Oh, I guess we're not doing the blood counter, huh? And leftover parts from the Diesel's left and smoke was everywhere. I mean, I knew trains were unreliable, but this is ridiculous. Here I was, thinking a train arriving 20 minutes late was bad, but look at this. Now they're exploding left and right. You gotta be careful out there. It ended right after with Thomas laughing in an evil way. <laughs> I wanted to throw up, but instead I grabbed the tape and threw it in the garbage. I don't know if I could ever look at Thomas the Tank Engine the same way again. Oh, that's the end apparently. I don't know, uh, this episode still managed to sound less insulting than the Thomas episode Wonky Whistle. That episode's the real kind of garbage. I am a very silly engine. <laughs> What is it? What? Oh, oh, don't be silly, Boo. That's just boxing kangaroos. Yeah. You know, Boo, sometimes reality is weirder than fiction. Barney, the lost episode. Yesterday, I was looking at my TV guide, and I saw something that caught my eye. Tonight only, a lost episode of Barney and Friends. First and only chance to see it airs at 7. Naturally, I asked my kids if they wanted to see it. Obviously, they said yes. I got the popcorn ready. They love to eat popcorn while watching Barney. <laughs> Only the most essential information right here. When the time finally arrived, they ran into the living room, turned on the TV, and sat down on the couch with me. It started the theme music playing. However, something wasn't right. When is it ever right in these stories? For starters, I could vaguely hear whispering during the music, and it sounded creepy. But I shrugged it off, assuring myself that it was just my imagination. Anyway, the episode began like it always does, with the kids talking about something while holding a doll version of Barney. Then poof, he comes to life, giggling like an idiot. He started speaking, and I turned it up slightly so I could hear it. Very important information there. Barney sounded slightly weird, as if two people were talking at once. One with his normal voice, and another that sounded demonic. I tried to ignore it, as these authors always do. That's when I heard Barney say, Hi kids! <laughs> Today I'm gonna teach you about death. I nearly fell out of my seat when I heard that. I wanted to turn it off, but for some reason I... I couldn't. The show kept going. Child 1. What's death, Barney? This is... His face suddenly turns angry and he grows teeth. He laughs evilly and he bites the poor child's head. 
For some reason, my children kept watching, not affected by the obviously disturbing stuff going on. <laughs> These are some tough as nails kids. Barney then proceeded to kill all the children one by one, each time roaring. The children at this point started to run away from Barney, screaming and crying for their parents to save them. Barney just chuckled and says, yo, 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 yo. Mommy and Daddy can't save you now. And he ate the children. <laughs> Then the green girl dinosaur and the yellow dinosaur came in, apparently not noticing the item children. <laughs> well, Barney, the green one said, what did we learn today? Barney grinned an evil grin and said directly to the camera. Remember, kitties, don't bother locking your doors and hiding under your bed, because sooner or later, I will find you and kill you all. <laughs> The rest of the damn episode showed a distorted picture of Barney with a blood-curling scream. Did Shadow the Hedgehog write this story? Where's that damn fourth, fourth chaos, chaos Emerald? That was the last straw. I reached for the remote and turned it off. I looked to my left and I realized that my children were nowhere to be seen. Thinking that they already ran into the room, I went in there. However, I didn't find them. That's when a voice behind me said, it's too late, Steven. I've already killed them, and now I'm gonna kill you. <laughs> I turned around to see a demonic, blood-covered Barney slowly walking towards me. Even when he killed me, he still sang that fecking song. I love you, you love me, we're a happy family. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I don't know about you, but I will never sleep again after this story. Yeah, what if random guys in Barney costumes try to break into my house too? I originally thought the chances of that were about 1 in 600 million, but this story changed my mind. Stay vigilant, people. It is a dangerous dinosaur world out there. I guess it's kind of spooky, hey? Number 9. Arthur's Nightmare. <laughs> That's a concerning title. I'm not too hopeful about the story's quality so far. One day when I was at my grandpa's house, there was a special episode of Arthur called Arthur's Nightmare. I was really excited about this, so I got this remote, sat down and watched it. It started with the intro, like in normal episodes. Then, when Arthur waved to DW, DW grabbed a, a gun and said, Go to hell, bitch. Then DW shot the TV with a gun and the episode started. I thought, hmm, I really thought that episode was meant to be good. What? What, what are you talking about, Arthur? The episode started with Arthur playing video games. Arthur said to the audience, Ah, video games. Who doesn't love video games? I do. So every time you see a video game up to this day, you get excited about that. I was really starting to get happy. Then DW came in the door and said, Arthur, I shot your TV. Arthur screamed and said, I don't know, maybe this is my first nightmare. The title card appeared. Then, when Arthur was sleeping, he's dreaming of boats and cars for two minutes, with a lo-fi beat to study to. Then, when the lo-fi beat was record scratched, Arthur got really scared. His face was purple, his teeth were pointy and sharp, and his eyes were red. I said, I am really scared. My mom watched it with me. <laughs> That's actually really sweet. Then when Arthur killed everyone, Arthur stared at the viewer and said, I need to kill you. And he did his falcon punch. <laughs> then the end credits rolled. I started to cree really loudly. Remember, if you see that episode, Arthur will come kill you at 3 a.m. The end. Well, that was weird. I guess it was just another wonky tape story. Very short, too. Yeah, th that was way too short. Personally, I'd like a bit more Arthur in this video, so here's another quick story of Arthur. Arthur TV. The episode starts. It shows Arthur reading a comic, there was a scream on the background, 
And a picture shows here, R and DW says, will you? And distorted, it's cut to static, and it shows DW running, and it's cut a black background, and says, a week of crying later. It shows Arthur holding a popcorn of bowl. A popcorn of bowl. That, that, that's quite hard to picture, really. And DW says, it's still my creepy time. It cuts to static, and DW cross her arms, and Arthur running and takes so long. It shows a black background and says 25 minutes later. It shows Arthur reading a comic and a scream on the background like the beginning and DW running. It cuts to black, background and a scream appear and a picture show DW, eyes are white and her face were red. Hey, Strider, did you understand any of that? No. No, Dennis, I didn't understand any of it. I think maybe that was meant to be a scary variation of the opening title sequence? Either way, I can't say I was blown away by the effort that went into this one. But I hope you keep writing, Arthur. Hey, Josh. No, I didn't bring a Ouija board. Number eight. Kaylu died. They couldn't even manage to get the title spelled right. We're in for some serious schlock here. I used to watch Caillou when I was two, and what I think of him now, he is a whiny, spoiled brat. There is one episode that got removed from PBS Kids, Teletoon, Treehouse TV, and Universal Kids. Season 5, Episode 79. So I was playing Gotcha Club on my computer, and then I heard a knock on my door. I got an episode of Caillou. I thought I got tricked. That is a dirty trick. Giving someone an episode of Caillou, what if they accidentally watch it? So I put the disc in, and the theme song was weirdly off. It went off key at parts. Caillou was frowning the whole theme song. It flashed weird images throughout the intro. And instead of, each day I grow some more, it said, each day I'm sad some more. Then it started with a title card. It said, the death of Caillou. It started at Caillou's house and with loud crying in the background. It then cut to Caillou's room and he was crying hugging Gilbert. He said to Gilbert, Why am I bald? <laughs> Gilbert re Gilbert re <laughs> Gilbert replied, Meow. Caillou went to his mom and asked, Mom, why am I bald? Caillou's mom then told Caillou crying, Caillou, sweetie, you're still alive, but we're going to have to go to the hospital. Caillou then screams, No! That can't be! Caillou's mom said, I'm sorry, Caillou, but it's how life works. Caillou cried so loud and then said, Why, mom? Why? Because of bad writing, I guess? This is extremely dramatic. Caillou's mom said, Sorry you had to know, Caillou. I was shocked when I found out Caillou is fat because it didn't say that on the on the wiki. I, I'm sorry, but what, what does that have to do with anything? Caillou's just been told he has a terminal disease and you're commenting on his weight? I don't even get this sentence. Was Caillou's mum still talking or was the author commenting that Caillou was pudgy? It's just... Uh, moving on. I continued watching. There was a time card saying, eight minutes later. It was back to Caillou's room again. It showed Caillou with a shotgun. What? Where, where did that come from? Why does Caillou... <laughs> where did he even get that? Then it cut to black. Then the credits played, but Caillou wasn't there and there was no music. I got in contact with the creator and he or she said, so sorry about that. We took the episode off the air and off the website. We won't show that episode again. Signed, the creator of Caillou. The cr creator of Caillou. You couldn't even be bothered to look up the name of the author in a five second Google search. It's Christine, by the way. Three years later. Wow, time certainly does fly. I showed my friend the disc and he had the same reaction. So that is how the episode never showed. Do not watch this episode unless you want to risk your childhood. Caillou. Wait, so Caillou wrote this message now? This is really confusing. Caillou is now removed from Teletoon, Treehouse TV, 
PBS Kids and Universal Kids on TV for good. So goodbye. What? Good, good, goodbye. One odd way to end it. Okay, so Caillou was removed from PBS Kids because of this episode? And here I thought it was cancelled because it was boring bratty garbage fished out of the bileless depths of the Canadian sewerage system. So as I understand it, Caillou was actually bald because he had a terminal disease? Well, not according to Wikipedia or Family Guy. Apparently it was just a weird decision by the creators. But Caillou wasn't a cancer survivor. The show's creators just made a weird choice. Well, it, it looks kind of spooky, I guess. Do you feel anything, Boo? Yeah. You do? What do you, what do you feel? Hungry. Oh, oh yeah, makes sense. Here, I brought your favorite. Yeah. Sesame Street, Big Bird Goes to Jail. It's no shock that Sesame Street has covered many situations that both children and adults struggle to deal with, such as death and even incarceration. But what many people don't know is that there was one episode of Sesame Street that was too scary to broadcast. The episode was filmed in 1994 entitled Big Bird Goes to Jail. <clears throat> that, that sounds pretty awesome, actually. Let's read on. I found out about this particular episode when working at the PBS network. I had worked there since 1984, and let's just say that I hated every minute of it. The boss was a jerk, and many of my co-workers were no better. I almost got fired after I attacked one of them, Josh, in a blind rage as he snitched on me for something I didn't do. Well, I'm sorry, but you left me no choice. There was no milk left in the fridge for my morning cup of tea. I know you like it long black, but some people like flavor in our tea. But anyway. I'll get you yet, Josh. I can't believe you've done this. My punishment, instead of getting fired, was cleaning out the archives. I thought that this would be the worst day of my life. I wasn't expecting what would come later. I mean, hey, credit where it's due, it's kinda cool that the story is at least giving a bit of a justification for why the author stumbles upon a lost episode. Instead of just finding it randomly on the internet or on the street or something, they find it while cleaning out the archives of where they work. It's at least something. As I was cleaning the shelves, I discovered an old tape, well from 1994. It was labeled Sesame Street. Prison episode, written in messy, sharpie writing. I set up the conveniently placed TV and VCR and pushed the tape through the tray. The funky 90s remix of the Sesame Street intro started, and when the official episode began, Gordon was the one to introduce the audience. Hi there, welcome to Sesame Street. Big Bird is very excited because today is his birthday party. Birthday party? What does that have to do with jail or prison? I thought it was just a mistake and continued watching. Big Bird then approached Gordon, claiming that he was really happy over and over again. Typical Big Bird style. I thought this was any normal happy episode, but what came next was so shocking that it still haunts my nightmares. Two cops come by, sirens and everything on, but when they get out of the car, they approach Big Bird and put two pistols at him. What on earth is happening? Gordon asked. Big Bird tried to say something, but just as he was about to speak, a third cop ran over and pepper sprayed and tased him at the same time. Then he pinned him down and cuffed him. Gordon tried to tell the cops that they were mistaken, but he received no reply. Big Bird, you're under arrest for the theft and attempted murder of the Cookie Monster. You have the right to remain silent, said the female cop. She dragged the bird to the patrol car. Gordon asked if he can accompany Big Bird. If you want to, say goodbye to him, that is. The female cop taunted, snickering. The car drove away. Obviously, this must have been a sick joke. A one-off prank on the PBS staff. I continued watching to see what would happen. It then cut to outside the jail. It stated that Big Bird has been charged with theft and attempted murder. <laughs> uh, I see. We have turned on the gritty Sesame Street reboot. It is quite the sight. Gordon, weeped Big Bird. I'm gonna miss you. Gordon tried to hold back. I'm gonna miss you too, buddy. Don't worry, you'll only be in there for 10 years. That's not so long. Gordon, you are one of the most amazing people I've ever seen, but I don't know if that was your crowning moment in terms of comforting Big Bird. Big Bird, hearing his sentence again, broke down realistically and uncontrollably, and soon after, 
Gordon shed some tears. The cops dragged Big Bird into the prison, or the Sesame Street County Jail, as it said on the sign, and one led Gordon to the exit. This is when the episode takes a really nasty turn. You would expect for Sesame Street standards that the prison would be fake, and the inmates would be Jim Henson's extra puppets. But hell no! The prison was real, and the inmates were just as real and dangerous as ever. When Big Bird and the officer walked by the cells, they automatically started jumping around and punching the cell doors to get to them. Have you ever realistically been to a prison, man? I've been to Wakehall many times and none of the prisoners were lunging at the cell doors trying to grab at felt puppets. He was then led into his pod, almost too small for him. Officer, I'm scared. Oh, you're scared, are you? Well, you asked for it. Get him, boys! The officers ran towards Big Bird and started beating him with nightsticks. The credits then roll over the scene and the tape popped out of the VCR afterwards. Oh, then I guess that's the end of the story. Honestly, Dennis, are prisons this bad in your country? Well, this was certainly like no Swedish prison that I've ever seen. Yeah, and I've never seen an Australian prison like this either. As I said, the prisons in Australia are very different to what was described here. But I guess our two countries tend to be more about rehabilitation than incarceration, when possible anyway. It, it, it's all right, it's all right. It's not. You're right, you're right, Big Bird. It's not all right, but it it will be all right. Peaceful, isn't it, dude? Yeah. Number six. Teletubbies. The truth. Okay, Dennis, I know we're about to read a story about the most vomit-inducing stupid show in the history of humanity, but apparently this story is super serious. It is? Well, okay. Let's get started then. In the years since I stopped watching television, I've never forgotten the Teletubbies. Something there hung with me. Was it vomit? Nope. Apparently, a foreboding. Something that the digitally enhanced colors, lilty childlike music and fluffy impish dancing couldn't wipe away. Something dark. Darker than most expect. What was it that resonated so deep in the core of me about Tinky Winky, Dipsy, Lala, and Poe? I woke up one night in a sweat. The revelation came to me and it shook me in my marrow. It is so much more complex than any child can grasp. I really wish it was. So thick is the subtext that it could be easily misinterpreted or miss completely by the adults that are watching. This show is simply a warning. Teletubbies is, you're not going to believe this, a dark Orwellian nightmare about a genetically engineered slave class creature being systematically trained to become part of our society. I, what is, I, I guess I'll keep going? In order for you to see what I mean, you need to TiVo or tape an episode. Just check the listings of your local PBS station. Just watch one and you will see exactly what I'm talking about. Then, perhaps the words that follow and the evidence I provide will resonate within you as they do in me. While no backstory has ever been provided by the show on where the tubbies come from, one thing is for certain. They are not in control of their own destiny. Okay, do tell. Three things control their day-to-day -day lives. First, there is the voice. Where have the tinny tubbies gone? A tinny female voice tells them when to eat, when to sleep, and when to say goodbye. Um, I could be wrong, as mercifully I have not watched the show in 17 years, and I hope to break that record, but I'm pretty sure that's a man echoing that syrupy garbage onto their creepy dump pile of a planet. The robotic maternal voice blasts from a speaker impaled in the ground, hinting that something larger lies underneath and is constantly vigilant. The second is Nunu, a harmless looking anthropomorphic vacuum cleaner robot who wanders after them, cleaning up their messes that they made and passively scolding them for bad decisions. Nunu is the watchdog the controlling tool of the powers that have placed the tubbies here. The third in the triumvirate is the iconic, menacing pinwheel. The pinwheel is the true power of Tubbyland, a mystical godhead that the simple-minded tubbies worship. When the pinwheel spins, 
the tubbies stop whatever they're doing and run to the top of the hill. Here, they perform a ritual for the gods in the sky, trying to curry favor. They gestate and roll around like puppies having their bellies rubbed. But only one can be chosen. When that one is chosen, they are blessed by having the genetically implanted bioelectric television screen in their abdomen activated. The tubby is rewarded not only by being the pinwheel's messenger to the other tubbies, but also, apparently, by a physical blairgasm of joy at the activation of the screen. And what does the screen show? It shows an indoctrination film. Here is the world of man and one of its customs. Learn, for you will soon join us, live among us, <laughs> and serve us. Among us! A message from the pinwheel god. I call it Revnoku, just because it sounds cool. <laughs> Fair enough, dude. It's your story, man. You do whatever you want. When the ritual of the indoctrination is done, the tubbies return to their day, childlike and innocent. And by that, he means the creepiest, most revolting things to ever befoul our television screens. Finally, watching over it all is the sun oh, Are we really gonna go there? The innocent, benevolent soul of humankind hangs over it all, illuminating Tubbyland. Kids can be jerks, I don't know what it's talking about. It is a form that the childlike Tubbies will understand and not fear. A form used to hide the watchful, totalitarian eyes that hide out from the darkness. I beg you to watch and decide for yourself. It's all there on the screen, and finally, for me, all the pieces fit. The Tubbies are alerting us to a future where genetically crafted androgynous worker beings will serve us. Slaves who will stumble and babble our way through their world. Pleasing us, for we are Revnoku! Ha ha ha! We are the soulless, immoral gods of their world. Teletubbies is simply a warning about the encroaching darkness, the decay of the human spirit. Teletubbies is about the end of the world. Is it though? Is it really? Honestly, if any of that was even remotely plausible, I'd probably like the show better. But the unfortunate reality is, Vomit Tubbies is simply the result of extremely lazy writing and being revoltingly simplistic and pandering. To be honest though, that story had some pretty interesting writing that wasn't half bad. If it was a joke story, then I think it succeeded with flying colors at turning the Teletubbies on their head. It was really funny and well done. I like how dramatic it was, and I think it was really funny. If it was not meant to be funny, it is still very entertaining, so either way, it is a win-win. Good stuff. I kind of like that. Yeah, I agree. There was a lot of creativity in this story. Props to the author. I'm sorry, Boo. Looks like you're the only ghost out here. Aww. Well, don't worry, man. You can hang out with me for a long time yet. Yeah. Sesame Street series finale. Okay, this story's a bit longer, but personally, I think it's awesome in how terrible it is. Let's dive right in. I'm pretty sure you've all heard of the popular TV kids show, Sesame Street. Yes, I, I suspect people on Mars will have heard of it. I is about a bunch of Muppets named Elmo, Grover, Big Bird, Oscar, The Grouch, Cookie Monster, Abby Cadabby, Zoe, Rosita, Ernie, Bert, Count Von Count, Snuffy, and the other Muppets I don't remember. Well, if you're sure we know about it, why did you list off like 15 of the characters? You could have just said Elmo and we would have all known what you were talking about. I went to a garage sale and found old tapes. I found one that said Sesame Street Series Finale AVI. I bought it and I paid for it. Isn't that the exact same thing? Then the manager said the Muppets will come to your house tonight. She said it in a scared voice. It looked like she was scared after what she just saw. What did she see? Did the employee bathroom flood again? You never specified. I then went home and slammed the tape into my VCR. <laughs> I love random acts of violence in my creepypastas. The tape began with the Sesame Street theme song, but something wasn't right. The theme song had low quality, and the theme song sounded distorted and low pitched. It sounded like if the tape was beaten. The episode starts with Elmo singing in a raspy voice. It then shows Rosita sitting down. Very important information right there. Everyone was depressed looks on their faces. It then shows Big Bird jumping and singing and also laughing. Nothing too disturbing so often. 
It then cuts to Grover flying Super Grover, as usual. But however, he then crashes into a plane and dies a horrible death. I almost cried, Grover was one of my favourite characters. It then cuts to Cookie Monster eating a cookie and are the other cookies. But the cookies are made of real people. I almost puked. A cookie with organs? Yuck. Also, I realised that Cookie Monster had bloodshot eyes and red pupils. This freaked me out. Poor creature. I then tried to change the scene, but it wouldn't let me. I then hid under my blanket. It then showed Elmo staring at the camera with pitched black eyes with red pupils. He said, Elmo knows where you live. He then said, Elmo knows that James lives in Chicago. I gasped. How did he know my name and where I live? Question mark, question mark, question mark. I then turned it down, but it won't budge. It then cuts to a picture of the Sesame Street cast appeared for five minutes. And you kept watching through all of that? I mean, I would personally get bored around the three minute mark. It then became static for 15 seconds. It then shows Elmo the same again. He said, we will learn about death. I was shocked at first. How did Elmo know a dark secret about death? This was insane. An image flashed on the screen. I played it back and it was a mutated kitten. I then played it back and realized it wasn't a kitten, but instead my cat chocolate. I almost cried at first. You almost cry a lot, main character. Maybe you should just, you know, let it out and have a good cry. I felt sad and hugged my... Ugh, tinky winky plush, and ran out the room and turned the lights to calm me down. I then called 911, but then I accidentally dropped my phone down the sink. What? How, how do you even manage that? How, how do you drop your phone down the sink? I then kept watching. It showed Kermit yelling at Cookie Monster angrily. Cookie Monster was now crying and then, weird comma, Cookie Monster had had enough of Kermit's abuse. He then grabbed him by the neck and strangled him to death. I then got worried at this point. Really? At this point in the story you got worried? Mutated kittens, organ cookies, and Grover dying horribly didn't quite tip you off? I saw there were characters abusing each other in a kid's show, question mark, question mark, question mark. That would never happen in a kid's show like this. It then shows a nuclear bomb <laughs> hitting Sesame Street and it all exploded and everyone died in a horrible, painful dot, 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 death. What just happened? I got horrified at this moment. It showed their dead puppet bodies. Cookie Monster has rotting into flesh and organs with stuffing. He's made of felt. How does he suddenly have organs anyway? And the others are even worse than Cookie, even Big Bird. The episode then ended with a black screen. The credits rolled, but instead of a normal theme, it was silent. I then took out the tape and smashed it with my hammer. Wow. No creepypasta has ever done that. Why does it seem like every creepypasta protagonist ever just seems to have this massive hardware store arsenal at their disposal? Maybe they're all part of the same construction union. Anyway, I then threw the tape into the garbage. I then contacted Jim Henson, the creator of Sesame Street. I I'm sorry, how? How did you contact Jim Henson? He's been dead for 33 years. Surely being dead gives you the right to not be contacted by random creepy pasta protagonists. I then told him about the episode I watched. He got confused and he said that he would never put anything disturbing or brutal. But he found out that it was a employee from PBS Studios who made this episode and got fired. Now, that sounds familiar. Then the police came and said what happened. This grammar, man. Why are the police telling the author what happened? I said I watched a list episode of Sesame Street. They said, where did the tape go? I told them I smashed it and threw it. They said, keep it a secret from a child. What? I then watched kid-friendly videos to calm down. I couldn't sleep for days and I had nightmares from this episode. I then looked at my window and saw a red muppet that looked similar. It was Elmo, that same look. And I saw the other Muppets staring at me. 
I then ran away from my house and hid under the covers. So, so you ran away from your house, outside your house, and then hid under your covers, outside your- What? I then looked, and they walked slowly towards me, and they sang the theme song from the show. They sang it in raspy voices. I then cried out for help, and the others came into my house, and the Muppets were taking over my house! I then jumped out the window, and I almost died, but I survived. <laughs> Lucky. I then noticed a person dressed up as a blood-stained pink elephant. He said his name was Tom McGrath, the person who worked on Penguins of Madagascar the movie! And that's where it ends. I, I guess the author just gave up at this point. Realizing the true horror they unleashed upon the world was their punctuation and sentence structure. What do you think, Dennis? Personally, I found that story really fun. I have to agree. That was an absolute masterpiece of a story, and I will never forget it. Okay, okay. I spy with my little eye something beginning with T. T? Yes, yes. I spy with my little eye something beginning with B. What? You just know me too well, Lou. Am I that predictable? <laughs> the death of brother and sister. A lost episode of Berenstein Bears. Huh. I actually still remember the Berenstein Bears book from when I was young. Yes, and I'm one of those people who remembers it as Berenstein. Though, from what I've seen, the actual title is Berenstain. Anyway, on to the story. On September 10th, 2005, the Berenstain Bears 2003 TV show was cancelled. This was because there was an unaired episode that was never supposed to be aired. The episode was so disturbing that it aired only once. One day, I was at a pawn shop to find some VHS tapes. While looking, I found something kind of strange. It was a Berenstain Bears VHS. It said, Berenstain Bears Final Episode, written with a blue sharpie. So I took the tape home. The episode started off with Mama and Papa Bear sitting on the couch, looking at the newspaper. The animation looks more colorful better here, more like the show's normal kulululers, although the audio was still backwards. So, it's normally backwards? I haven't watched the Berenstein Bears show in a long time, but I don't remember the audio being backwards. The newspaper says, New Bear Country Airport Trip. Papa Bear said, Brother, sister, we are going a plane trip. When brother and sister bear came from their room, they looked upset. The screen fades out with a bear family going on the plane. As the plane was in the air, brother and sister ran to escape. Mama yelled, Brother and sister, what are you doing? You both come back here right now. They didn't reply. Instead, they opened a door and were sucked out. They began to fall and started to scream and died. Then, it showed a hyper-realistic drawing of brother and sister bear's dead bodies. And for once, the author actually screenshotted the image for us. But be warned, it is very, very realistic. Strider, are you ready for this image? <sighs> okay, I think I'm ready, Dennis. Let's see it. Okay, here it goes. <gasps> oh, Jezebus, that's eerily realistic. Yeah, I think I'll be remembering the screenshot for... Minutes? Then it cuts to Mama and Papa crying in the table. Okay. The crying didn't sound like cartoon crying. It was realistic crying in pain. There is a slight static sound and it cuts to brother and sister bear's funeral. Everything is black and white instead of colorful. Everyone has grim expressions as they stared at brother and sister in their coffins. The camera cuts to static, and the episode ends with a black screen and text saying, The Berenstain Bears are died. The series is over. Have a nice life, kids. Goodbye. <laughs> Damn. Swift and straight to the point, huh? Then the credits roll. For some reason, only listing writer Stan and Jan Berenstain, the creators of the Berenstain Bears. Then the tape ended. I was too scared. I threw the tape in the trash can. I wish I'd never seen this Berenstain Bears episode before. If you see a Berenstain Bears episode that has blood and gore and scary images in it, don't watch it. 
well author if they've seen the blood and the gore and the scary images they've, they've probably already watched it well at least the series was nice enough to say have a nice life and bid their viewers farewell many cartoon series are ended suddenly with no notice of their upcoming ending whatsoever yeah i mean maybe there's actually quite a deep message about the dangers of compulsive behavior from children or not making your planes airlock childproof now oh, well, what do we got next number three the brake van a lost Thomas the Tank Engine episode creepypasta. Thank you for including what your story is in the title, author. It makes it much easier to find. I am an avid lover of Thomas the Tank Engine, so you can only imagine my excitement when I found a DVD of the show I had never seen before at a rare DVD and VHS store. It was simply entitled The Brake Man. Naturally, I picked it up. When the man at the checkout counter saw what I had picked up, his mouth fell open. Why are you getting that one? He asked in fright. I am an avid lover of the show, I replied. Very well, said the man. Watch at your own risk. Well, clearly with an amazing sales pitch like that, he, he really wants his customers to return. I arrived home and popped the disc in my DVD player. There was no menu, it cut straight to the episode. The normal opening segment started, but everything seemed tinted red. And there was no sign of the famous logo for the series. And there was a bit of static. Chalking it up to nothing more than animation errors, I kept watching. Then it cut to the episode. The narrator was like none I'd ever heard before. Was that a German accent? Oh, cursed be. Not a German accent. Woo. S seriously, what is wrong with the narrator having a German accent? Maybe the author just has an irrational fear of German strudel. Well, I kind of get that. I was never much of a fan of Bratwurst myself. Anyways, the episode started with the narrator saying, It was like a normal day on the island of Sodor. Everything seemed normal. According to the narrator, Percy was to take a load of rocks from Nat Ford Station to Brendam Docks, but there was no more usable brake vans. As Percy explained this dilemma to Thomas, all color drained from his face. Well, there is one brake van, Thomas said. The old brake van that has never been used, as far as any of us know. All right then, said Percy. There was a brake van in the yard that had taken a dislike to Percy. The audio then cut out, but from what the scenes showed us, Percy was collecting his trucks for the journey ahead. As Percy was leaving the docks, static like I had never seen before came onto the screen. He continued this way for about 25 seconds. What do you mean by static you've never seen before? I wish you would elaborate on that. Then it cut to the top of Gordon's Hill. Percy was attempting to pin down his brakes, but the trucks were starting to push him down the hill. I want to stop! I want to stop! He puffed. Percy tried with all his might to apply his brakes, but to no avail. This is where things get very scary. The next shot is the brake van, with cuts all over his face and a mouth stitched in a smile. Music is playing in reverse, and static is flashing on and off the screen in three second increments. The next shot is of Percy hitting a large rock, still applying his brakes into the shrubbery. Then he came off the rails, and thanks to sparks from his funnel, his wooden brakes in the shrubbery caught a blaze, with Percy screaming in a more realistic voice, like maybe the hyper-realistic kind of screaming. Then the brake van told him, there's no hope for you in hell. The last shot of the episode is Percy's blackened body for 10 seconds, and then Percy's sad face with blood tears. The end? Well, I don't know. That's for you to decide, author. You set Percy ablaze, so I guess that's the end. Repellent with DEET is the best stuff. Humans have been using it for 78 years, and it's completely non-toxic to us. Works like a charm. Thomas and the Children. Have you ever heard of Thomas the Tank Engine? Yeah, yeah, author, we all have, yes. My son adored Thomas so much that he could name every single train. He knew what colors they were and the number they had painted on them. The show started in 1984 and continues to this very day. I was glad when I heard that he was coming to visit me over the summer, but I had a ton of work to do, so I bought him a Thomas DVD. The cover looked innocent enough. What was also interesting was that Thomas was smiling and little wooden children were waving their arms out of the windows in his coaches. The DVD was called Thomas and the Children. He was so excited to see the DVD that right off the bat, he pleaded with me to pop it into the DVD player. I went to work while he watched it. After a few hours, he came into my office, looking pale as he spoke. 
Daddy, his voice seemed weak. Are you okay? I said. I touched his head and noticed his temperature had gone up. Why did Thomas hurt the children? My heart sank like a stone, but I soon brushed it off. I'm sure Thomas didn't hurt the children, I reassured him. Now, you need your rest and some medicine. I gently pushed him toward his room. Come on now. After putting him to bed, I got curious as to what he'd seen. I popped in the DVD and began to watch the episode play. It seemed normal enough. Thomas was told to take a group of children to the seaside by the instructions of Sir Topham Hatt. You know, the Fat Controller. I noticed something odd though. There was no narrator in this episode. No Michelangelus? Travesty. He was such a deep part of what made the show special. Deepest respects. It then showed Thomas picking up the little wooden children and showed every single one of them climb on board. Then there was a scene of him zooming down the rails like he always did, and the kids were cheering. But then there was trouble, as they say in the show. Bertie the bus was stuck on the railway track. This is when the episode got strange. Ugh, buckle up, everybody. Bertie stared at Thomas in fear, but Thomas just smiled and sped up. He maniacally laughed, and the kids were crying with little tears coming down from their wooden faces. Thomas gleefully crashed into Bertie, causing pieces of them to go flying everywhere. Usually by now, the narrator would say, luckily no one was hurt, but there was no reassurance for the kids. The episode then showed what happened inside the coaches. Wooden limbs had been broken off, and what looked like actual blood had been splattered everywhere. And what was worse, the children still had tears painted on their faces. It then cut to static as it always does. After that, I felt myself boiling over with anger. What sicko would create something that messed up for little kids? I then paused the static. Messages started to appear on the screen like kill, obey, multiply, and die. I watched the static and saw at least 30 different messages flash on the screen. I threw the accursed thing in the trash after breaking it in half. I would not expose my child to any more of that trash. Before going to bed myself, I checked my son's room. He was happily asleep and snoring, clutching his teddy. I had a nightmares from this. One where the children came into my room, but they were lifelike and as tall as a normal person. Their twisted forms grabbed my limbs and pulled me apart. All while I heard that blasted train laughing. Now I have woken up. I heard the doorbell ring. I found a Trackmaster Thomas toy that had children painted on him. Oh. The humanity? The poor plastic train? I don't know about this one, Dennis. Did you find that at all scary? Well, I personally didn't find it scary... at all. But I at least liked the main character in the story, the dad. He was really cool, actually. Yeah, me too. A lot of creepy pasta protagonists can be real jerks, but this guy seemed like a genuinely nice, decent dude. He was just trying to be a good dad. What do we got next? <sighs> and for number one... Sesame Street VHS. Props to the author, by the way, for including screenshots of the show. After seeing this, how can we deny this was a real episode? I was at the family video store and found an old Sesame Street VHS tape. I bought it, but a big mistake was made just by doing that. I've never heard that before in a creepypasta. I've made a huge mistake. I should have bought a DVD instead as VHS tapes were obsolete, but I bought it anyway because why not? I'll say, in 2022, I honestly have no idea how you even have a VHS recorder. It basically was a combination of skits that they had a terrifying twist from an early Sesame Street episode. The cover had a picture of Big Bird. However, I didn't pay attention to the not suitable for young audiences label on it, as I thought some stupid teen stuck the label there as a freaking joke. Introduction. In the beginning, Elmo welcomes us to Sesame Street, but the background is red. Big Bird missing AI runs across a bridge with water underneath. I saw his eye in the water, and a slower, demonic version of the Sesame Street theme song started to play. Elmo eats the organs out of another monster, laughing while he's eating it. <laughs> I knew there was something up with that Elmo. His true colors have finally been revealed. The next scene shows Cookie Monster in a cookie facility, where cookies are made out of people. Didn't we hear that before? I guess many creepy pasta authors just think Cookie Monster making cookie people is just a really creepy idea. I don't know. Cookie! 
After that, it shows Ernie squeezing his rubber ducky so hard that its head flies off. Ernie then eats it. Afterwards, the theme song returns to normal and the red background disappears. But when Grover starts flying as Super Grover, he crashed into the airplane, and the airplane exploded. The music becomes slower and more demonic, and the background is red again. Can I, can I just say I really want to see this episode? So far, most of it sounds kind of hilarious. This is the author's list of the episode's skits and twists. Kermit's B Lecture. It's the same, but after the screen turns white, the white feeds into the background, becoming flames, causing the bee to melt. Beautiful Day's monster mouth is an eye. One of his eyes are black, and Beautiful Day's monster starts to scream. And also, the skit plays in reverse. Cracks, the crack master bleeds, and he rips the heads of the camel, chicken, and monkey off. Bob Lewis and the train. When the train hits a screen, it becomes covered in organs. A blood-curling scream is heard, as if someone is being murdered. Pattern completion. The pattern space, when revealed, makes a sound of a demonic laugh. Wet paint. Everyone sings in a rather depressing way, and the paint doesn't look like paint at all. It resembles blood. Fat Cat Sat Matt. The three Muppets force the interrupting character in a wood chipper. The Mystery Box. The Cookie Monster finds a noose in his box. Count to ten with nobody. The skit starts normally, but when nobody gets to six, he says it three times and the screen cuts to static, which lasts for five seconds. Nobody then says, I'm coming for you, tra la 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 la. I'm coming for you, in a very demonic whisper. In the box. The monster in the box, Fred, bites Grover's head off and Fred eats it, but Grover is somehow still alive and walks off. Elmo sits on the step of a sunny day with a sad look on his face. Mr. Hooper comes up to him and asks what's wrong. Elmo yells, Leave Elmo alone! Mr. Hooper leaves, and Elmo picks up a gun after 30 seconds of utter silence. Everyone tells Elmo not to do it. They take his gun, but Elmo decides to jump off cliff. Elmo dies, but he dies and his corpse fouls in a rover. He then whispers, I'm coming. Scene 2. After the skits, it cuts to Sesame Street being hit by a nuclear bomb. After that violent explosion, it cuts to a horrifying image of the cast. Why is it horrifying? He doesn't say. Did they all just have bad hair days? And it went to black for 20 seconds and the episode ends. Oh, well I guess that's the end of that then. Well, I can say with certainty now, after hearing all that, this sounds like a pretty hilarious lost episode. If it somehow ever did exist and was ever leaked on YouTube, I would definitely give it a look. Greetings, little one! <laughs> and with that, we've reached the end of the PBS Creepypasta Vault. I hope you enjoyed the journey, and thank you, Dennis, for once again helping me check out some not so stellar creepypastas. It's my pleasure, Strider. We go way back, and I always enjoy being on your show. It's always a blast, and I really appreciate it. Ladies, gentlemen, and all else, thank you for your time, and until we meet again, good bye. Take care, Dennis. Stay safe. And I hope you do the same. Please look after yourself and each other. And as always, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. Goodbye.